Okay, folks, so welcome to uh, the first Pulse Colloquia uh, talk for the 2018-2018 school year. Today I am super, super, super excited that we have Derek Dreyer here. Uh, for those of you who are new to Derek's work, Derek's done a, a sort of had this pattern of discovering modularity where it looked really hard to extract uh, throughout his career. And this was uh, represented in early papers like effing modules. He's also good at paper titles. Uh, and uh, really fancy program logics like IRIS, uh, which we've uh, been looking at as part of the, the diesel work uh, for inspiration. Um, but today we're going to hear uh, more about uh, Rust Belt, which is a project to uh, reason about this uh, new programming language, Rust, which maybe you, you've seen for doing type safe systems programming. Uh, along the way, Derek's collected a lot of awards, including the Milner, Milner Award in 2017. And he also has a killer whiskey collection. So plenty to ask him about during one of them. Please take it away. Thanks, Zach. So, um, so thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I'm excited to tell you about Rust Belt. So this is a project that uh, we've been um, we've been doing now for a couple of years. It started in uh, in uh, uh, about two and a half years ago, um, and uh, I'm particularly excited about it because uh, I've spent a long time, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing research on programming language theory, where we you know we build a lot of these type systems and logics and semantic models and uh, uh, all this sort of uh, mumbo jumbo, and uh, you wonder if it has anything to do with a real programming language, uh, and uh, and so uh, I'm I'm happy to say it does, uh, and that actually um, uh, there's 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 some work that's that's come out of the programming language uh, and verification community over the past 20 years, that uh, has a direct relevance to both understanding and evolving a major new actively developed programming language called Rust. So how many of you have heard of Rust? Yeah, okay, I figured. <laughs> you know, for different audiences, you get different results. But I figured okay, that, that one was easy. And how many of you have actually programmed in Rust? Well, those, those are pretty good. Uh, how, many, how many of you have proven that Rust is a uh, safe language? <laughs> 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 Usually one of those questions, there's like two people raise their hand or something. Um, uh, so I have to adapt to talk for different audiences. OK, so um, uh, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, so indeed, uh, Rust Belt is, uh, uh, is all about the Rust programming language. So let me just, I know you, many of you know uh, a bit about it, but I'm just going to uh, go quickly through some of these background slides. So, so first of all, uh, the basic idea of Rust is that it's trying to address a long-standing problem in the design of uh, programming languages, namely how do you balance safety and control. Right? So on the one hand, you have sort of high-level uh, languages like Java and uh, C Sharp and Haskell and Go. These are sort of, they're, developed, they're, they're intended for building high-level safe applications. Uh, they have nice high-level abstractions, uh, automatic memory management, things like this. Uh, but they don't let you write, uh, uh, they don't give you sort of low-level control over resource management and data layout and memory. Uh, and for those kind of language, uh, for those kind of um, tasks, you are forced to work at a much lower level of, uh, of programming in uh, low-level unsafe systems programming languages like C or C++. Um, and those, those give you much more fine-grained control over uh, over uh, resource management and performance, but at the expense of losing these nice high-level uh, safe abstractions. So the question has always been, can you somehow get the best of both worlds and, and get uh, a safe systems programming language? So um, this is the sort of niche that Rust is trying to fill. And um, so a few things about Rust. So basically, it's been developed at Mozilla since around 2010, um, uh, and it's uh, Mozilla is still the biggest user of Rust. They've been using it to build Servo, which is this next-generation browser engine that has, uh, uh, you know, geared for better parallel performance. Pieces of which have been already integrated into Firefox uh, since last year. Um, and I think the reason that a lot of people are excited about Rust is that it's the only systems programming language uh, pr programming language so far to provide three things. One is low-level control over uh, resource management in the style of modern C++. Second is strong safety guarantees, uh, things like type safety and memory safety, but also uh, data race freedom, which is not something you typically get in other safe high-level languages. Um, and uh, third, and definitely not least, it's, it has industrial development and backing, which is essential for the language to be adopted. So, uh, so those three things alone, I think, are sort of uh, make it a very interesting object for study, and there has been very little study of Rust so far. Um, uh, Another thing is, right, so there, there are, although Mozilla is still the prime user of Rust, there are many other companies that have small teams or, uh, you know, groups within them that are, that are uh, uh, um, using Rust in production code. 
One of the examples of this is Dropbox, which rewrote a, a core component of its block storage engine from Go into Rust uh, in order to get better control over its memory footprint while still maintaining safety guarantees. Um, but there's many other uh, companies using it. When I first gave this talk two years ago, uh, the number was like the number I was given by people at Rust was over 15 companies. So, um, so this this number is is, is going. Up. So you know. Uh, at a high level, the point here is uh, I think Rust has the potential to become a sort of next big thing in systems programming. All right, so enough sort of marketing stuff. So like, now let's get to the let's get to the details. What's what's actually interesting about Rust? So um, so basically, the idea of Rust, the core idea, uh, which you would hear about also if you've heard if you've heard talks about Rust before, is that the the sort of root of all evil in systems programming is the unrestricted combination of mutation and aliasing. So um, in particular, if you have like multiple aliases or references to some object in memory, and one of those references is used to access it and maybe mutate it or deallocate it, reallocate it, uh, this can result in things like dangling pointers, use after free errors, uh, data races, uh, iterator invalidation. We'll, I'll see an, we'll see an example of that in a second. Um, and these are all sort of common anomaly, very very common anomalies in in in, in C++ uh, programming. And so the idea in Rust is that it wants to try to prevent all these kind of errors using uh, uh, what's, called, what's often called an ownership type system in the academic world more, uh, more often a substructural type system. Um, and uh, the basic idea of that type system is the following. So the, the basic idea is that um, uh, what Rust tries to do is it tries to uh, enforce a certain principle, which is that an object can either be mutable or it can be aliased. And it can go back and forth between both, uh, between being mutable and being aliased, but it can't be both at the same time. Um, and the way that this is enforced is through this, as I said, this idea of ownership. So the idea is that in a standard language, uh, you know, uh, in most most other languages, if you have a value of type t, let's say value x of type t in your in your scope that you can refer to, well, you can refer to it as many times as you want, and it, it, uh, uh, that's perfectly fine. In in Rust, if you have a value of uh, uh, of type t in your scope. It means you know something additional about it, which is that you own that object. Meaning there can't be other pieces of the program that have access to that object at the same time. Okay, there can't be other parts that have aliases into it or anything like that. So this means once you have, that means you can, you can mutate it as much as you want without fear of, of, of uh, invalidating any other references into the object. Now, of course, you do want to be able to create references to an object. So, uh, so that's supported through something called borrowing. You can borrow a value of a certain type that creates references that can either be shared or mutable. Um, and basically, the difference is that if when you when you create something by when you create a reference that's um, that's mutable, it's the unique reference that that's the only reference that can be used to access it. And correspondingly, you are allowed to mutate through that reference. You have, in other words, mutation but no aliasing. Um, the other one is shared, so you can make a, a shared reference by, but as the name suggests, you can make arbitrarily many copies of that reference. Uh, and share them with different threads, for example, but they cannot be used to directly mutate the object. So there you have aliasing, but no mutation. So this is the basic idea of the language. And, and to sort of make this a little more concrete, I'm going to um, uh, go to a demo. This is not a very exciting demo, but uh, uh, I feel it's a little more. Yeah, OK, good. Um, right. There. OK, so, um, so here's, this is like sort of Rust 101. So this is just a little program that creates a vector v um, containing three elements, one, two, three. Uh, it pushes uh, an element onto the end of the vector, 42. And then it just iterates over the vector and prints out the element. OK, it's nothing very fancy. Um, so you know, just to show you what happens, if I uh, run this in Rust, uh, and can you see that in the back? Is that OK? Uh, it prints 1, 2, 3, 42, as you'd expect. OK. So now. Um, See what happens if I move this push onto the vector inside the uh, inside the for loop. Okay. Um, so now, what what do you think will happen or should happen when I try to compile this? Thank you. Well, you have the ampersand, so you should. I have the ampersand, yes. So, okay. So that's a that's a sort of that's a that's that's correct. Uh, that's going to be a, that's a fairly technical explanation. So, uh, is there like what what would go? Uh, let me put it the different way. What would go wrong if indeed? Uh, so you're right that Rust is going to reject this. What would go wrong if if Rust were to accept this? Okay. Wait, say again. 
It should be an infinite loop, right? Because every time you're trying to iterate over something, you're also adding something. Uh, there's a more, that, that, that could be, but there's a more basic problem. Uh, no. Well, uh, eventually, the buffer you are sticking your vector elements in is going to be too small. Mm -hmm. And so you're probably going to have to go copy the entire vector somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that for loop is going to have a pointer to who the hell knows what. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that, there's a safety violation here. Right, and the safety violation is that, so I mean, I didn't tell you exactly how the, how the push operation works, but the way that the push on the vector works is that when you push onto the vector, um, it, it tries to uh, add it within the space that it's already allocated. If it runs out of space that's been allocated, then it has to reallocate the whole vector, copy it over, and then, uh, and then this for loop will be operating on a, on a dangling pointer. Okay? Um, so this is a common phenomenon uh, known as iterator invalidation. And, uh, uh, in a language like C++, you would not get any static. Uh, you would, I mean, that, that, that happens all the time. So let's see what happens when you actually um, do this. All right, so we see that. Oh, it's off the end there. Um, right, so you see it says, cannot borrow v as mutable uh, here. Mutable borrow occurs here. Cannot borrow v as mutable because it is also borrowed as immutable. Okay, so this is getting back to what you were saying. So at this point when we created the iterator, we actually, and you, were, you had to write this as an ampersand V in the code, you actually uh, created an, uh, a shared or immutable borrow of, of V to pass it to the, uh, to the iterator. Okay. Um, and that means that while the iterator is active, there can't be any other, uh, you, you can't do any mutable operations on the vector. Right? And in particular here, what, the, what you may wonder why it says mutable borrow occurs here. Well, implicitly when you call the push function, it takes as an argument a mutable reference to the vector. Uh, so this is, there's some syntactic sugar here that's actually creating a mutable reference in order to pass to the push function. Um, so it's saying, well, you can't possibly create a mutable borrow here because cur there's currently a shared borrow uh, in scope. Now, of course, you may wonder, like, how does it know that the shared borrow is in scope? Or what is the scope during which the shared borrow is active? That's, that's, that's handled through something called lifetimes, which I'm not going to get into in this talk. Uh, but uh, basically the lifetimes are sort of inferred scopes uh, during which a reference is allowed to be used. Um, and uh, so in particular, you would hope that um, uh, if I move this uh, operation outside of the loop, right? Um, so if I move it after the loop, uh, that this would be allowed because now the, uh, you know, the, the, the iterator is over. And so I should get back control of the vector and I should be able to mutate it. Um, and indeed, um, it is, okay, and that's fine. And so there's something, the point is, the point of this example is just to show uh, Rust is doing something useful, it's preventing iterator invalidation, and it's quite subtle because it has to figure out what is exactly the scope during which that reference that was passed to the iterator is, is allowed to be used. Uh, and, and not make it, you know, it doesn't want to make it the rest of the program, it wants to make it as small as possible. So, so Rust is doing quite a lot of, uh, of useful stuff here. So that was, uh, that's, my, that's my demo. Okay, um, so, uh, so, th so the, the story I've told you so far, this, this idea that Rust is preventing the combination of mutation and aliasing, is, is uh, at a high level, this makes a lot of sense. This is the story you'll hear if you hear talks about Rust. Unfortunately, it's, it's actually false. Um, and uh, uh, the reason is that um, sometimes you need the combination of mutation and aliasing, okay? Um, so, uh, in particular, if you're implementing a variety of different kinds of, uh, of, of libraries, so for example, pointer-based data structures, doubly, for instance, so such as doubly linked lists, fundamentally rely on the combination of mutation and aliasing. Synchronization mechanisms like locks, channels, and semaphores, uh, to implement that, you need to implement communication between threads. And you need to, to implement that, you basically you fundamentally need shared mutable state. Um, memory management, uh, 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 libraries like the, the reference counting libraries in Rust, uh, again, fundamentally rely on shared mutable state because you have multiple aliases to an object and they all need to be able to, uh, to modify the reference count that's stored in the object. Um, so uh, these things cannot be implemented in the safe fragment of Rust. Uh, and so what do you do? Well, here's what, here's what actually happens. Uh, oh, sorry, before I do that, uh, I forgot. I'm going to show you an example of, of, uh, of, of, of some of these libraries and how you can use them to do, to, to have shared mutable state, but in a safe way. So, um, uh, so here I'm going to show you how you, you can take an object x of type t and you can share it between multiple threads that can all mutate the object, but only in a synchronized way. Okay. Uh, 
And this is using two libraries, Arc and Mutex. Okay? And I chose, these, I, chose these libraries, I chose this example and these libraries specifically because I'm going to return to Arc and Mutex later in the talk and talk about sort of why, this is, why these libraries are reasonable. Um, Mutex, what is it doing? It's providing synchronized access to X. So that means that the only way you're going to be able to access the underlying object and get mutable access to it is by calling the lock method on the Mutex. Um, Arc is then allowing dynamic sharing of this Mutex uh, so you can make arbitrarily many copies of that mutex and spread them uh, to different threads without tra explicitly tracking the lifetime of those references. Um, okay, so uh, this is just a little example to show you how you could, uh, what you can do with these libraries now that we've wrapped it in an arc and a mutex. You can spawn a bunch of threads. Each one uh, is going to own its own clone of the arc. So you first clone the arc. Uh, you then uh, spawn a thread and you move the, the ownership of that clone of the arc into, uh, into the ownership of that thread. Uh, and then you can have, uh, and, then if, and then each thread, when it wants to access the underlying object, it calls the lock method uh, on, on, on the arc. Implicitly here, there's a dereference of the arc that happens. Uh, and then it calls the lock method, does some error handling, and now you basically get, uh, in, this, in the scope of the thread, mutable access to the underlying object through this handle y. Okay? And the whole point is, this is something you cannot implement without using these libraries because Clearly, you're getting shared mutable state, right? And that's something that's disallowed by fiat by the type system. Um, but it is allowed here because these libraries sort of give you a safely controlled use of shared mutable state. Yeah? Could, sorry, could you just say that bit about move louder and more slowly? Yeah, it's, I'm not, it's not so important for this talk. But basically, what's happened, the move is just, this is syntax for saying move the thing. It's basically moving the ownership of my data implicitly, because that's a free variable of the closure, into the scope of the. It, it's saying the free variables here have to be moved into the ownership of this closure. Yeah. yeah. What's the type of log? Yeah, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> you may wonder why I didn't write the type of log. I, I'm, I'm fudging some details. I mean, this is correct code. Uh, but, uh, well, okay, modulo the fact that there's no code here. But, okay, whatever. <laughs> I, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it gets a little... You get into like mutex guards and stuff like this, which I didn't want to show. All right. um, so yeah, morally you can think of it as you have like an ampersand mute of t. That's not quite right. It's it, it, it's more complicated than that. But, so the yeah. lock gets released automatically. <coughs> yes. This is this is what's called in the C plus plus world a RAII style, right? So you basically you acquire the lock and then implicitly when y when this handle goes out of scope then it gets uh, unlocked. Yeah. <coughs> OK, so this is just a, sorry, this is a positive example of what you can do with these libraries. But of course, as I said, this means you're going, somehow we're going outside the safe fragment of the language. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is these libraries fundamentally extend the expressive power of Rust. And they do that using unsafe code. So the idea is that most of the code in Rust is written in, 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 in sort of the Rust ecosystem, is written in the safe fragment of the language. But then there are these libraries, like Arc and Mutex and many others, that provide so-called safe APIs that are internally implemented with unsafe code. So meaning that inside their implementations, at some point you'll see these unsafe blocks where additional operations are permitted that do things like raw pointer manipulations that are not sanctioned by the, the core type system. Um, and uh, so the claim that the library developers will you know, often want to make about these uh, APIs is that if you write your code in using a safe fragment, uh, and uh, extended with calls to these APIs, you will never observe any undefined behavior. Okay? So as long as you don't use unsafe features yourself, except uh, the, the ones that appear inside these safe APIs, you're OK. And you know, as a verification person, uh, I get very excited when I hear claims like that. Right? It's, it's very, uh, that sounds like a fertile, fertile ground for, uh, you know, uh, for research um, and bug finding. Um, so uh, to give you an example of the kind of problems that have arisen and that continue to arise, um, so there was, a, uh, there was a blog post, a very nice blog post that Aaron Turan, uh, who's the, currently the manager of the Rust project, uh, wrote a couple years ago right before the 1.0 release of the language. And this was um, basically, it was, he was sort of showing, uh, he, was, he was actually uh, touting the benefits of this whole approach that I've talked about so far, this sort of safe uh, core extended with, uh, where its expressive power is extended through these libraries. And it built up uh, a bunch of interesting concurrent libraries from simple ones to more complicated ones. And 
And the, the sort of piece de resistance of the whole uh, blog post was this library for scoped threads, which were um, basically it was the it allowed you to, to spawn uh, threads that had access to the parent thread stack frame. Uh, and this is something that's that's not typically available in safe programming languages. So um, uh, so that was that was like the you know that was that was the very exciting conclusion of the post. Unfortunately, so the 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 the, con the fearless concurrency here was a little too fearless. Uh, because on basically the same, I think it was the same day that he actually posted this, uh, someone found a bug in the uh, scoped threads API, um, and uh, and this led to a lot of um, some embarrassment uh, for uh, uh, for the Rust community, and and it was I was like, <laughs> you know, especially coming a few weeks before the 1.0 release. Um, so if you want, I'm not going to tell you in detail about the bug. Uh, it's actually very interesting, but uh, basically the point was. Um, you could combine this API with another API that was very common, the reference counting API, uh, and you could, and by the combination of those two things, you could get use after free errors, um, uh, and this came to be known as leak apocalypse. And you know, th this is uh, it's the kind of thing you, you don't want to happen. You, you don't want to uh, have happen right before the 1.0 release of the language. But also, I mean, you, uh, this is not like a one-time problem, right? This is the kind of thing that will continue to keep happening because people are always developing new APIs. There, uh, in fact, one of the benefits I would say of Rust is that People keep building, um, n they keep finding new safely controlled ways of, uh, of manipulating shared mutable state. This is a, like a very common pattern in how people develop Rust code, and they, they put these things out as safe APIs. Um, and so you want to have a way of saying, like, you know, how do I know that this is actually safe to do? Um, so how can we ensure formally that bugs like this uh, don't occur? So this is, the, um, this is the basic goal of the Rust Belt project. We're trying to develop the first logical foundations for Rust. Uh, we want to use these foundations to verify the safety of both the core Rust type system and standard libraries and, and future libraries that people will develop. Uh, and in particular, we want to give Rust developers the tools they would need in order to uh, safely evolve the language and have confidence that the libraries they're building are, are safe to use. Um, and so I'm going to talk, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the goal of the project. Um, to, in the rest of the talk, so first of all, I want to I want to go into a little more detail about what I mean by safety. So, by the way, if there's any questions, feel free to. Okay. Good. So, um, so what do I mean by safety? So, uh, first of all, the standard so the the, the standard uh, approach to, to programming language safety that people have taken in the in the um, in the programming language community for a long time is this so-called syntactic approach that I'm sure many, that all, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, um, due to Wright and Felizen, and this progress and preservation approach. And the problem is that the um, syntactic safety approach fundamentally assumes there's no unsafe code. It assumes that your entire language is safe. Okay, um, and so basically this doesn't work for Rust. Okay, um, yeah. Can you just unpack that? I mean, yeah, sure. sure. So the the idea of syntactic safety, right, is you say Here's, you know, I take the notion of well-typedness on programs, I lift this to machine states, and then I, I prove this progress and preservation theorem. Um, what? Yeah. Yeah. Said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this assumes that your, uh, your notion of uh, well-typedness covers the whole program, right? So now, I mean, the problem is with unsafe blocks, basically you have pieces of the program that are just not syntactically well-typed. I see. But you can always invent more breadcrumbs and more syntax to box them, state their assumptions, you know, basically reflect the assumptions of the API like in the syntax, right? And I, I don't want to just wait, you know. I just, I just so I, yeah, so I don't know how to do that for a language like Rust. Okay, fine. And, and um, fair enough. I, I don't want to derail. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, just I'm in general, trying to push right? on what's the technical point here. And sure. your technical point is just, hey, um, I clearly need to reflect back into my syntax everything about the machine state that's relevant to safety. How do I do that for what's essentially a foreign function thing? Yes. And you and I could discuss over a beer sometime, like how one might do that or might not. And, but it's certainly not. It's, it's not certainly not plain old boilerplate. No. Do it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and uh, so basically, I mean, you you need to have a way of saying. So I mean, currently, what happens is, right? If people people give an API in Rust, um, they have some idea in mind of what property the implementation is supposed to satisfy in order to be uh, considered safe. But it's not a syntactic property, and it may depend on arbitrarily complicated invariants about 
why that code is, uh, about the data structures that code is maintaining. Uh, and so that's not something, those kinds of invariants are typically not the kind of thing you see in a, uh, expressed in, a, in typing rules, put it that way. But I, so I, I can't say it's impossible to come up with typing rules, but the point would be, even if you could, it wouldn't explain, uh, you're right, ultimately the, the, the language is extensible. People keep coming up with new APIs that are not valid for the same reason that other APIs are valid. And so if you wanna explain why, you know, sort of have one unifying framework to explain why all those things would be valid, you need some other more semantic approach, and that's the approach that we've taken. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and so basically the idea is we wanna generalize to a notion of semantic safety. So very, very roughly, uh, the idea is a library is semantically safe if there's no way that any uh, application that is constructed from a bunch of these semantically safe libraries and, and syntactically safe code can get it to in, induce undefined behavior. Let's get into a little more detail about that. So, so first of all, the idea is you take, uh, basically what we, what we do is we define a semantic model. This is a mapping uh, from, from types, the, the types of the language. Right? So you give me an interface of a library, which is just basically a type. It tra I translate that into a safety contract, which is a, essentially a verification condition that the implementation of the library has to satisfy in order to be deemed semantically safe. And then I prove two things about this. I first of all prove that if the library is implemented entirely in the safe fragment, in other words, the syntactically safe subset of the language, um, then it satisfies its safety contract by construction. Okay. Um, second, I prove, uh, second, right, for, for the libraries that do make use of unsafe code, I have a manual verification burden. Okay, I have to show that they satisfy their safety contract, but at least I have a safety contract against which to verify them. Okay. Um, and then when you put these together, this is what you get. So basically, remember this picture, most of the code is written in the safe fragment of the language. That code is safe by construction. All you have to do to prove the safety of your program is to manually verify the libraries that you use that make use of unsafe code and prove that they semantically inhabit their APIs. They, they satisfy the verification condition corresponding to their APIs. Uh, and then, uh, you know, those can be used in any safe program. Okay? Yeah. Your framework for thinking about this kind of automates that little link there. Like the, you know, the link is is automated. Yes, yes, yes. As long as the right, as long as the types match up, syntactic. Yeah, as long as the compose things according to the typing rules of the language, which, uh, yeah, then then exactly. Okay. So uh, so this is basically what we've been uh, we've been doing uh, in Rust Belt. So we had a, we have our initial paper on this was in Popple this year, um, where uh, we showed how to do this for a. Uh, 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 a, a representative but somewhat simplified version of the of Rust, uh, which made various simplifying assumptions, which I, I'll, I'll get to some of those later. Um, but uh, uh, but yeah, so basically we took this approach and we, we showed how we could do this for Rust. And what I want to do in and oh sorry before I get to that, um, the the first thing to say is this is not a new idea. So this is this idea has been around for a long time. Uh, this basic idea of semantic safety. Uh, However, most, almost, basically all, all the prior work has done this for much, much more toy languages, all right? So very simple, much more simple lambda calculi. Uh, nothing with a type system as sophisticated as Rust's, uh, and nothing with uh, you know, libraries that are doing as, as complicated uh, low-level things as Rust libraries are doing. Um, so basically what I wanna talk about in the rest of the talk is the key challenge, uh, in, instead, instead of going into a lot of details about Rust that will be sort of somewhat impenetrable, I'm gonna go and try to explain what is the key challenge that we faced in, in doing something like Rust Belt. Um, and that is figuring out what is the right logic in which to express these verification conditions, okay? Uh, because, you know, if you, if you try to express, so in, in, if you take the approach that a lot of previous work has done on semantic safety, uh, you, you may have seen things like step indexed models, uh, step index logical relations models. If you haven't seen them, don't worry about it. Uh, but if you have, they're quite complicated uh, and low level and, and difficult to reason about. Uh, and so what you really want uh, is a logic that is sort of higher level and matches better the, the, the concepts of, uh, the, the intuitive concepts of the Rust language. So it provides a sort of higher level framework in which to carry these proofs out in an easier way. Um, and I don't know if anyone has any guesses as to the sort of general framework I'm gonna suggest. How about Iris? <laughs> we know too much. <laughs> Even simpler than that. Operation logic. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so, 
Um, so separation logic. So how many of you have heard of separation logic? How many of you have ever used separation logic? OK, good. Um, good, because I'm going to talk a lot about separation logic. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I'm hoping you don't know that much about it. OK, so basically separation logic, uh, right, as uh, probably most of you know, uh, is an extension of Hoare logic that was developed by Peter O'Hearn and John Reynolds and several others about 20 years ago. And um, they originally developed it as a sort of logic for uh, reasoning sequentially about pointer manipulating programs, um, or sorry, reasoning modularly about sequential pointer manipulating programs. Um, it was intended as a sort of yeah, a much more modular framework uh, for doing this than, than, than plain Hoare logic. Uh, it's had a major influence on many verification and analysis tools. Um, and uh, for our purposes, the reason that it's really interesting is that it builds in as a primitive concept this idea of ownership, okay, which is like the fundamental thing in the Rust type system. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's essentially a perfect fit for modeling Rust's ownership types. And we'll see this in, in more detail um, uh, later in the talk. So um, unfortunately, we can't just take separation logic and use that. Okay? Why? Well, there's, there's uh, two major reasons. Uh, the first one is that there's not just one separation logic. Okay? There's uh, many separation logics. Um, there's actually more than seven. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> So the first one here, for our purposes, is concurrent separation logic. This is by Peter O'Hearn and, and Steve Brooks uh, um, from around 2004. And uh, this, is like, this was like a fundamental um, advance, uh, I think, in, in program verification. They, they showed how the, uh, um, the basic idea of separation logic, although it was originally just for, it was intended for sequential programs, it actually is also extremely useful for reasoning about concurrent programs that, that manipulate shared state. Uh, and, and we'll be getting into that in more detail later. Uh, the problem is there had been a lot of advancements since then, right? So the original CSL uh, was, was remarkably powerful, but there's many things it can't do. And so uh, as a result, you have uh, many, of these things, many of these logics coming out. And there was a paper by Matthew Parkinson um, uh, from 2010, actually, uh, which had this nice quote said that, uh, you know, in recent years, separation logic has brought great advances, blah, blah, blah. However, there is a disturbing trend for each new library or concurrency primitive to, to require a new separation logic. Okay. And that's exactly the case. So if you read the, all the papers on concurrent separation logic, you get a headache because each one is like saying, you know, uh, here's this new fancy thing. Uh, and then the one after it says, well, yeah, that was nice, but you can't handle this example. And then you can't handle this example. Um, and so, you know, this is a major problem if you're trying to build a model of a language like Rust because, as I said, new libraries keep coming up all the time, right? It would be bad if we spent all this effort building a safety proof of the language, and then a new library comes up, and we say, well, we don't know how to verify things. We don't, we don't know how to verify that because our logic was too uh, limited, right? And then we have to redo the whole model. So you really want to have some very general logic in which to express the, uh, the semantic model of, of Rust uh, that you don't have to keep changing all the time. The second problem, which I'm not going to go into in much detail today, but I want to mention, um, uh, is the issue of the memory model. So, uh, most of the previous logics, uh, most of the previous work on concurrent separation logic has assumed sequential consistency as the memory model for, uh, for concurrency. And this is just not realistic for the way that um, high, perform uh, high performance concurrent libraries uh, work, in particular in Rust. Okay, so Rust has a variety of concurrent libraries that make use of uh, C++'s um, relaxed memory uh, atomic operations. And uh, I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into detail about this issue, but I just wanted to mention that uh, this, is, this is something that is uh, sort of uh, a, a basic assumption of, of all this prior, prior work on, on concurrent separation logic. And if we want to be able to build a model of Rust as it actually is, we need to account for relaxed memory. So, um, so this led to two general directions of work that, that my group and my collaborators have, have pursued over the past several years. Um, one of them, which I will talk about a lot today, is Iris. Um, so this is a sort of general unifying framework for concurrent separation logic uh, that uh, is intended to uh, sort of subsume a lot of the prior work on, uh, on concurrent separation logic and offer a way of a sort of general platform for doing uh, concurrent separation logic proofs in the future. Uh, uh, GPS is a, uh, was the first modern separation logic for the C++ memory model that accounts for uh, some of the uh, uh, sort of a core fragment of, of, of uh, relaxed memory operations in C++, and we've been developing that further uh, as well. In fact, the truth is these, are two, these two are sort of joined together now because we've, uh, in our ECU paper from last year, we showed how we can actually encode GPS inside Iris as well. So um, uh, it, it's all sort of 
one thing, but I'm not going to get into all the weak memory stuff uh, in this talk. So for today, what I want to do is actually start by reviewing, in the, in the remainder of this talk, I want to start by reviewing uh, the basic idea of concurrent separation logic and how that works. And then I'll give you a taste of what, what IRIS is about. And, uh, and I'm going to use these examples of ARC and mutex that I talked about earlier as the sort of running examples to show how this works. Any questions? OK, good. So CSL is a whore logic. Uh, I assume most of you know whore logic, so I'm going to be uh, quick here. So um, that means the, the basic uh, thing we're proving are these whore triples. Um, they have, there's the piece of code we're verifying, C. There's the precondition. This is the property that is assumed to hold of the state before you run C. And then what the whore triple says is that if the precondition holds, C is safe to execute. It will not have any undefined behavior. And if it terminates, we're proving partial correctness, um, then the post condition Q holds and, uh, of the final state. Okay? So that concludes my presentation of whore logic. I... <laughs> um, I hope you found it illuminating. Um, <laughs> um, so, separation logic. So separation logic basically takes the idea of whore, uh, uh, the basic ideas of whore logic. I mean, really, I mean, the, well, yeah. <laughs> One could say more about whore logic, but um, the truth is, in this talk, I'm actually not going to go into much detail about rules. I'm going to show you, I think, two rules, and otherwise, I'm going to sort of do proofs by animation. So, um, <laughs> um, <coughs> so it's not so important that we go into all the details about the rule of consequence and all that stuff. Um, okay. So, uh, so in separation logic, basically, there's two new things you get. One is that assertions P um, are not just denoting facts about the program, but they're denoting ownership of state, as I said. That's the key thing in separation logic is ownership as a primitive notion. So this is, uh, so the, the canonical example of this is the points to assertion, x points to V, which says that if you assert x points to V in your precondition, it means that the thread or the, the piece of code you're running owns x, right? It not, not only does it know that x points to v, but it owns x. So that means there can't be other pieces of the program that are running at the same time that are accessing x, OK? Um, secondly, there's this idea of disjointness of state. So uh, and, and, this, and this, uh, this, this connective separating conjunction, or star. If you say p star q means that not only do p and q both hold, but they hold of disjoint pieces of memory, OK? So for example, if I have x points to v star y, y points to w in my precondition, then not only does it mean that x points to v and y points to w, but also that x and y do not alias. They don't, they're not equal, OK? Because they have to be pointing to disjoint locations. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, they're, uh, yeah, there's no reason why they can't, why the contents of those locations couldn't be equal. Um, yeah, you mean you know, like if v and w were pointers themselves? For example, yes, yes, that's fine. Just means that these two memory cells are disjoint. OK, so to see an example, oh, sorry, before I get there. Um, uh, uh, so basically, so OK, that, that concludes my presentation of separation logic. No, I, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, OK, so <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how this rules get used. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so concurrent, that was basic separation logic, OK. But uh, concurrent separation logic basically takes that, that, th those, those basic concepts of separation logic and extends it with two rules. Uh, there, there's a few other sort of structural rules, but basically there's two important rules. One is the rule for disjoint concurrency. And this is the, what's called the parallel composition rule. This says, if I have two threads, C1 and C2, that are operating, uh, uh, two, two pieces of code that are being run in parallel, C1 and C2, um, then I can verify them completely independently as long as they're operating on disjoint pieces of state. And operating on disjoint pieces of state means that their preconditions, P1 and P2, are joined by the separating conjunction in the precondition of the, of the, of the parallel composition. Okay? So this way, I know that P1 and P2 are talking about separate pieces of memory. So if they're talking about separate, separate pieces of memory, there's no interference between these threads. Okay? Um, so I don't, have any, I don't have to worry about any reasoning about interference. So to see how that works, uh, right here you have an example where you have, uh, um, again, like x points to 0 and y points to 0. Uh, uh, but they're starred together, so I know that x is not equal to y. And now I'm going to verify this code that has one thread modifying x and the other thread modifying y. Um, and you can just do that by verifying them separately, right? So this is often how you see these proofs written on paper. Uh, you prove sep one, in one thread that x uh, goes from x points to 0 to x points to 3. Here it goes from y points to 0 to y points to 4. 
and then you just glue them together at the end. And you don't have to reason about any possible interference because that interference has been ruled out implicitly through the separating conjunction. That's like the poster child for separation logic, or for concurrent separation logic, is this kind of example. Um, but it's it's kind of boring. Let's let's face it, right? So we want what we really care about, right? The, the whole motivation for a lot of this work was how do we reason modularly about this shared state that shows up in in these uh, these libraries using unsafe code. So that's handled through uh, the second rule that CSL introduces, the invariant rule. So the idea with invariance is that if, if I want to reason about shared state, the way to do that is to impose an invariant on it that all threads have to, all threads can assume, but they have to maintain. Um, I'm not going to show you exactly how you create the invariant. It's not that it's complicated. I'm just trying to uh, simplify things. So let's just say we have a way of establishing an invariant R on some piece of shared state. Okay? I'll write that as invariant R. Okay? Um, so we've established that invariant. And then the rule says the following. If I want to verify some piece of code C, um, then I can temporarily transfer ownership of the shared state into my local ownership. Okay? I can gain ownership of it, do whatever I want with it, as long as I then re restore the invariant R when I'm done. Okay? So I do that by transferring, by, when I say transfer it into my local ownership, I mean star it onto my precondition. Okay? Now I own both what I had before, my original P, plus this R. And I know they're disjoint because initially I had local ownership. It was sort of the thing I personally own. Uh, was P, so that couldn't be uh, um, overlapping with the, the, the shared state R. Okay? And then I have to restore it in the post condition. Now you see there's this condition that C is atomic. Does anyone, anyone see why that is important? By atomic here, I mean only takes one step of computation. Yeah? You want other threads to observe the broken variant? Right. You, you, exactly. So in this step here, in this reasoning, of the premise, and improving the premise, you can break the invariant internally within that proof. So if C were to take more than one step of computation, uh, it might break the invariant. Another thread might then go and try to use this rule and expect the invariant to hold, and that would be unsound. Right? So if C only takes one step of computation, then the, the internal breaking of the invariant within that proof cannot be observed by another thread. Right? And here again, we're, we're assuming a sequentially consistent sort of interleaving model of computation. Um, okay. All right. So let's see how this works, okay, uh, using the mutex example. So this is a very, very cut down version of mutex, but it gives you the idea. So basically, um, the mutex is going to be represented by this pointer x, which either points to 0 or 1, okay, 0 for unlocked and 1 for locked. Um, and there'll be two methods, uh, lock and unlock. Uh, again, this is very simple. The lock is just doing a, a, it's just a, a spin lock, so it's just going to keep trying to compare and set uh, x from 0 to 1, from unlocked to locked. Uh, and there'll be multiple threads racing on, the, uh, on, this, uh, on this location to try to win the race. And whichever one wins, uh, successfully does the CAS, will then return. And unlock just sets x back to um, unlocked. So the unlock assumes that the caller of unlock owns the lock. OK. Um, so here's the specification that we could give, or a specification we can give in separation logic. Let, let's say that P describes, is, a, is an assertion that describes the invariant we want to assume about the resource that's protected by the lock. Okay? Um, here's the spec you would give. So first of all, anyone can call the lock function. The, the precondition is trivial. Okay? Uh, because you want to allow multiple threads to do it at the same time. So anyone can call it. And whoever, once you successfully return from lock, you gain ownership of P in your local, in your local state. Okay? That you get, you, you, the ownership of P has been transferred from the shared state into you. In order to unlock, you have to give it up, right? So you have to have P in your precondition, but you lose it in the postcondition. Okay? So implicitly, that's, that's how you get this sort of ownership transfer in between the local and the shared state. And then the nice thing is, right, if you want to verify code, you know, a bunch of threads that are accessing uh, using uh, the lock, then, well, right, so you have, a bu you have here, we have two threads. Uh, they have precondition and postcondition true, so you can, uh, using the parallel composition rule, true star true is equal to true. So you can verify these completely independently. Uh, and internally, they just acquire the lock. They get ownership of P. They do whatever they want. Here, by the way, this critical section does not have to be atomic. Right? This is just um, whatever, whatever code you want that, that manipulates P. It has to restore P at the end before calling unlock and then uh, returns. Okay? So this is, uh, uh, this is how you could use the, the mutex spec. So how do we prove that the mutex implementation satisfies the mutex spec? Um, 
here's, uh, well, first of all, in order to do this, right, there's some shared state, which is the x, the pointer x. So we have to establish an invariant on that. And here's the invariant. It's going to say, I'm writing it as a disjunction, OK? And to visualize this disjunction, I'm just going to write it as a little state machine with two states where you can go back and forth between them, OK? Um, so either you're in the unlocked state. In that case, we know x points to 0. And the invariant owns the resource described by, the, by this assertion p. That's the shared resource. Um, in the locked state, we know that x points to 1. But we don't own p, because in the locked state, whoever acquired the lock they own the resource described by p. And in fact, they may have broken p. So p may not even hold at that point. Given this invariant, we can now uh, verify the implementation of the, uh, of the mutex. I'm just going to show the proof for the lock uh, method. So it has, uh, remember, pre, pre, uh, precondition true. Here's the implementation. There's basically two cases. I'm going I'm to slightly. Uh, uh, hand wave over a few details here. So there's there's two cases. There's two interesting cases basically. Or there, there's two cases. One of them is is boring. The, the boring case is when the CAS fails. Okay, because when the CAS fails, you just you know you just try again. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's the case when the X was in the locked position. So that's not interesting. The interesting case is when the X was unlocked, so the CAS actually succeeds. And then basically we're verifying this. We're verifying that doing this CAS uh, should give us the post condition P. Um, so in that case. We can apply the invariant rule. And the idea is, right, oh, sorry, I did that too quickly. Um, so remember, the idea of the invariant rule was that it lets you transfer ownership of, uh, of the shared resource described by the invariant into your local uh, precondition, as long as you can reestablish re it in your postcondition. So we're going to transfer ownership of x points to 0 star p uh, into our precondition. It's really that star true, but the, the true is, uh, doesn't do anything. Um, and now uh, we want to see what happens. Uh, right? So the, the, the key thing is now we own x. So we're actually able to do the CAS. That's the thing you need in order to actually execute the CAS safely is ownership of x. So we do it, and we get x points to 1 star p. Um, now we need to reestablish the invariant again on the shared state. And we can because we have x points to 1. So we can transfer that back into the, uh, into the uh, in the, in, into the invariant, and we keep p in the post condition, which is what we needed to show. Okay, um, so this is basically, and then that's the that's the end of the proof. Um, this is the uh, this is a very common pattern in these proofs that you use the invariant URL, you transfer ownership in, um, uh, you you use the ownership of some physical state like x in this case to actually perform the operation, and then you do something to reestablish the post condition. And notice that the the footprint. Right, sort of the, the piece of memory that was described by the invariant has changed before and after the operation. Right? Before, it owned the shared resource. Now it doesn't. This kind of implicit ownership transfer that's allowed by the invariant rule is, is a key to the power of concurrent separation logic. OK. Any questions about that? Good. So to recap, CSL basically extends plain separation logic with these two rules, one for the sort of boring Disjoint concurrency, where it, it, it makes uh, it says you don't have to reason about interference at all, and one for reasoning about interference using invariance. So, moving on. Um, so we need to uh, so 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 CSL is great. The uh, in fact, uh, if you haven't read the original paper on CSL by O'Hearn, um, it's called like resources ownership and local reasoning or something like that. Uh, you should. It's a great uh, paper that shows how just these mechanisms I've showed already allow you to verify it, tons of really interesting and, and sort of uh, daring forms of concurrency. But uh, it doesn't do everything. So um, the reason why there's been many uh, much following work is because uh, you want to be able to generalize this invariant mechanism in two ways. Uh, one is you want to be able to describe how state changes over time. So the invariants just tell you what is a property that holds always. But you also want to be able to say things like the value of the shared counter only increases over time. Um, you also want to be able to control who can make the changes to the data structure. Uh, uh, and this is often done through things like permissions. You may have heard of fractional permissions, tokens, capabilities. There's all sorts of mechanisms like this in these, in these concurrent separation logics. And often these two things interact. Like you may want to, um, uh, you, you may want to uh, say that at, at a certain point during the program, certain threads can make certain changes, and that changes over time as well. So. Um, so, so basically, these two things are the, are the uh, you know, sort of variations on these are the ways that uh, CSL has been extended. Uh, 
And it's been extended in many different ways. So this is, uh, you've probably, if you've been to Poplar or something in the last couple of years, you may have seen this photo, or this, uh, this picture. It's, this is actually slightly out of date. So uh, this is due to Ilya Sergei. Um, and uh, it's a family tree of concurrent separation logic. So you see CSL is like up there, and there's been a lot of work since then. And there's, there's another, I think there's another layer or two at this point. Um, so, uh, so this is, you know, it's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, I didn't write so many. Uh, yeah, I, no, I didn't do so well. Okay, that, well, now this is weak memories. So that doesn't count. Um, I did this and this. Yeah. Um, but it was actually it was my work on this that my, on this carousel logic. That was my first work on concurrent separation logic that made me realize. Um, yeah, actually, the history was we worked. We did this paper. Um, and uh, then we, we were asked to write a book. Uh, me and Lars Burkadale were asked to write a book about, well, about logical relations and all this kind of stuff. Um, and we thought, oh, yeah, let's do it in a separation logic. We just did this carousel logic. Maybe we'll use that. Um, and, uh, and then we thought about it. And we were like, no, this is too complicated. We have to simplify if we're going to write a, a sort of pedagogical text about it. Um, and we talked to Aaron about it. And, and then he had some ideas. He had this, uh, the basic idea of how we were going to simplify it, a basic, the basic idea of Iris. Um, and then he sort of sketched that out, and then he left for, uh, to go to work on, uh, on Rust. Uh, and, we, and, and, and my student, Ralph Jung, sort of um, led, the, led the charge after that. Uh, but uh, it was actually the, the whole project started based on trying to simplify things to, for, for writing a, a textbook. <laughs> we didn't write the textbook, but we... Uh, uh, <laughs> although we're, we're trying to work on that now, but... Uh, um, anyway, so, uh, so this is bad in itself, but it, what's worse is when you actually look at these papers, okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so the first one, that was mine, okay, so that, that doesn't look too bad. But, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, it's not, it's not simple. Um, and, uh, uh, and yeah, so the, the, the I mean, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious, right? Obviously. It's okay to have some complicated rules now and then, right? I mean, sometimes proof principles are, you know, you're reasoning about complicated programs, you need complicated rules. The problem is, really, that these rules were baked in as primitive in the logic, okay? Meaning, each logic, to, to prove the soundness of the logic, there was a separate soundness argument for each logic. And they were all, you know, they all used different models. And so you might say, well, you know, that, I, you know, I, that, that rule looks nice. I'll use that rule uh, for one program. Uh, but then, and I want to use this rule for another program, but you have no idea if you'll be able to put these together into one, uh, uh, or sorry, if you want to use this for one module in a program and this for another module, right? Uh, and you want to put these into a proof of the whole program, you don't know if the whole thing is going to be sound. Um, so you really need one unifying logic uh, so that you can sort of use whichever rules are appropriate, you know, whichever rules are, are the best rules to use uh, uh, for different uh, modules, and you want to know that they'll compose. So um, there must be a better way, obviously. Uh, and there is. So uh, that's what Iris is about. So Iris, uh, the basic idea of Iris is very simple. Um, this is somewhat oversimplifying, but the, that's essentially the, the main idea, is that really all you need are invariants a la CSL. The slight, the, the slight lie. They're, they're a little, they're <laughs> I'm slightly lying here, but not, not, not too much. Really, the, basically, the, as I've shown it. Um, plus uh, something that I will talk about now called user-defined logical state. Uh, and using just these two mechanisms, you can derive the rules of these most ad advanced extensions of concurrent separation logic within Iris so that you can use them for different pieces of your program and you know that everything will compose. So to illustrate this, uh, rather than starting with what is user-defined logical state, I'm going to start with an example and show you how we use, uh, how, how logical state comes up uh, in verifying that, and that's the ARC example. Again, this is extremely idealized. The idea is that, uh, X here is going to point to um, this X representing an arc uh, is going to point to two uh, object with two fields, the reference count and the, the payload. And um, I'll assume the payload is just a one word here. Uh, and then there's three methods: the clone method, print, and and drop. So clone is uh, going to give you a, a clone of the arc. So what does it do? It bumps up the reference count using a fetch and add. This is an atomic fetch and increment operation um, on the count field, and then just returns a reference to the original X. Right. So it just gives you an alias to X. The print function is just printing the data. Okay, not very interesting. And the drop function is uh, the, de the destructor for the arc. So that is going to decrement the, uh, the count field. And if it notices that it was the last one out, so if it notices that, that, that the count field was, was set to one, then it'll free the whole object. 
Um, okay. So here's a spec that we're going to prove about this. So first of all, I'm going to introduce something called Archivex. So this is an abstract predicate describing the permission to access shared data through the ArcX. Okay? Um, and that arc of X is going to be the precondition to all the operations. Right? Uh, so here we have the clone method. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, right. In the clone method, basically what happens is you start with an arc of X and you get an arc of X star arc of Y. So it gives you a new arc permission to the same underlying object. And you know it's the same because, remember, we saw that the implementation will return Y equals X. So actually we're getting arc of X star arc of X in the end. Um, here we have the print method, just returns the same arc of x, and the drop method will take arc of x and consume it so that in the post condition you don't have that privilege anymore because you're dropping the arc. Okay, and that's the spec that, uh, that we'll want to prove. Now you'll probably notice something strange here, which is this, which is that, you know, I told you before separating conjunction was supposed to talk about disjoint pieces of memory, but here we have in the, re in the result that we're returning an arc of x star itself. And both of them are presumably talking about the same, I mean, they're talking about the same pointer x. So how does this make any sense? Well, this is where this user-defined logical state comes in. Arc of X does not describe physical ownership of the heap. It couldn't possibly because you have, these, you have, your, you have, a, you have that arc of X star arc of X. So instead, it, it's talking about a purely logical idea of, uh, 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 of, uh, of state. Um, and uh, this is where this idea of user-defined logical state comes in. So arc of X is describing ownership of a logical permission to access this object, which can be separately owned. Um, and to reason about this arc of X, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce two axioms. Yeah, yeah. All right, so it looks like this spec uh, guarantees that you won't have use after free, but it looks like it doesn't pr necessarily prevent memory errors. Or, uh, sorry. Leaks. Uh, leaks, yeah. Correct. Okay. That's right. And also, Rust doesn't matter. Really? Yeah. Um, that's right. So this is all partial correctness, and uh, and it does, and there's no exactly there's no guarantee of absence of memory leaks. Yeah. This is actually part of where the leak apocalypse thing came in. They they sort of thought that some things they were doing were preventing memory leaks, but they weren't. <laughs> I'm not going to go into more detail about it, but uh, yeah. Um, anyway, so I'm going to declare these two axioms, and we're going to use these axioms in the proof. And you're going to wonder why is it okay to just declare these axioms, and you're going to be right. Um, but uh, I'll get back to that, okay? So here are the axioms, and they talk about this other predicate called count of xn, okay? I know this is a little magical, all right? I have to get magical towards the end of the talk. So, um, <laughs> so the idea is that count of xn intuitively describes this, this uh, as an exclusive uh, assertion, which says it tells you exactly what, how, how many arc permissions have been created. It says that n arc permissions exist in the world at the moment, okay? And so the first axiom says, if n arc permissions exist, and separately I own one of them, then, it, then n must be at least one, OK? Clearly, because I'm showing you that I own one. Uh, the second uh, axiom it lets you update this, this count, uh, increment or decrement. So if I, if I know that there are n arcs right now, I can spawn new one off. Uh, right, I get arc of x there in the, in the right-hand side. And simultaneously, I bump up the, refer uh, the, the number to n plus 1. And I can also go the other way. And if you're attentive to detail, you'll notice that this arrow has two lines, and this one has three lines. And I'm not going to explain why. <laughs> um, but basically, <laughs> it's because this one is implication, and this one is a kind of logical update operation that actually changes the underlying resource. Uh, I'm happy to go into more detail about that afterwards if you want, but since I'm running short on time, I'll just um, proceed. Okay, so let's assume we have these logical operations. Um, now we can define the invariant on the arc object. And it says the following. It says that at all times, there exists a number n, which is uh, such that I own, the, in, the invariant owns this, this, uh, this count uh, uh, predicate, which says that it knows there are n arcs out there, uh, n copies of this arc x. And in addition, either n is 0 or uh, the shared or this invariant owns the, uh, the predicate describing x, uh, the x object, and its, its count field, uh, its reference count field is n as well. Okay? So this is kind of the logical predicate saying I know that there's n arc permissions out there, and this is the physical predicate saying that I know that the count field of x is n. And you notice in the case when it's 0, we don't own. Uh, uh, x, because in the case when it's 0, the object has been freed. Okay, so 
then uh, we don't own the physical state. Right? So this invariant ties the logical state to the physical state. All right. Uh, so just to show that visually, right? I'm gonna because I'm gonna show you this again. This kind of proof by flying predicates. Um, uh, uh, we have this sort of transition system where you can go between any state from any state to any other state, except from zero. Uh, you can't go to any other state because in the zero case we don't have the x predicate. So here, like in the four state, we own, we own x points to four or something, et cetera, et cetera. In the zero state, we don't own x. Um, here's the thing we want to prove. Uh, the first thing I'm, I'm going to show you basically how we prove clone. Um, the, the first thing to observe is that all these operations uh, take arc of x as a precondition. So does anyone know what that, can, can anyone see what uh, property that guarantees you when you're doing the proof? Or what important, uh, yeah, what important property that guarantees? The reference count is non-zero. And therefore, you own x. Uh, yes, exactly, right. And therefore, therefore x is, alloc is still allocated, right? You can actually access x. So all of these operations access x. So they better be able to show that the count is not zero because they need to be able to get ownership of x. Uh, and exactly, and the way, the way that works is using this, this axiom I showed before, you open the invariant, you see, well, I own count of xn, and I own arc of x, so I know that n must be greater than zero, so I must be in one of these states, so x must be allocated. OK, good. Um, so I'll show you briefly how this proof works. Remember, this is just doing a fetched increment of the x count field, and we're returning x, arc of x star arc of x. Proof proceeds as before using the invariant rule. So first thing we do is we, we say, all right, we know we're not in the zero state. Let's say we're in the two state, all right? I mean, obviously, in the proof, you don't actually say we're in the two state. You say, I'm in any state that's greater than zero. But <laughs> again, in order to enable proof by flying predicates, I, I'm going to pick the case where it's two. Um, and so the first thing you do is you transfer ownership of, the, of x into your precondition. Okay. Now that we have ownership of x, we can perform the fetch and increment, and we get x points to 3 something. Uh, and now, uh, now what do we do, right? We're kind of stuck, because uh, we want to rest restore the invariant, but the logical predicate on count says that, we're, so that the count is 2, and the physical one says that the count is 3. So we have to somehow fix that. And the way we fix that is, again, using that other axiom I showed you which lets you go from count of xn to count of xn plus 1, and thereby spawning a new arc. So by, by applying that, we go from 2 to 3, and we spawn this arc up there. And now we can put, we can put that in our, uh, our post condition, and we can restore the, the invariant, because now the physical state and the logical state match up. So again, that goes back into the shared state, and the invariant has been restored, and we got this extra arc out in the, in the result. And you know, I know this is kind of, uh, as I said, this proof by flying predicates, it looks a little um, dodgy, right? But uh, this is actually how the proof looks like when you do this in cock. Um, so uh, I mean, it doesn't look like that, but it looks <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it basically, in terms of the experience as you're, as you're you know, executing the tactics, uh, it basically has a, a similar effect. Um, OK, uh, so getting back to these axioms, right? So I just threw up these axioms magically. and. Uh, and you should have been very alarmed because um, that was my whole complaint about these other logics was that they have all these complicated proof rules. I just threw up some new uh, proof rules. How do we know they're consistent? This is exactly what Iris is designed to do, okay, is to make uh, proofs of consistency of these kind of sort of uh, example-specific axioms easy. And I'm not going to go into detail about it, but I just want to sort of sh show you what, what, what the basic mechanism is. The basic mechanism is, you know, I define this notion of logical state, this arc predicate and this uh, count predicate. Those can be actually modeled in terms of something called a partial commutative monoid, which you probably have heard about. This is the same kind of model that's used in basic separation logic um, for describing heaps and disjoint uh, composition. Uh, but basically, the idea is that with, with, with Iris, you can pick any PCM you want for describing your notion of logical state. It doesn't have to be the standard heap one. Uh, and then, once you've picked that, then Iris gives you two primitive proof rules for reasoning about it. One is a rule that lets you split up ownership of logical state, and the other one lets you update it. These are the two rules. They're pretty simple, I think, compared to the ones you've seen uh, that, I, that I showed earlier uh, that were baked in as primitive in other logics. The first one basically just says that if I own the composition of two, thing, uh, two resources, that's equivalent to separately owning the two resources. So sort of the monoidal composition is reflected in the separating conjunction operation. Um, and the other one is something that allows me to update a resource A, uh, ownership of A, to ownership of B, if I can show that that is a frame-preserving update. 
again, I'm not going to go into detail about it, but basically it's, it's, it's just saying I can, I can go from A to B if I know that that's not going to disturb any, uh, uh, the reasoning about ownership of any other resources that exist in the world. And using those two things, then we can derive much more complex rules like the ones that I showed before. Right? These, we showed in the original paper how we could derive some of these kind of rules uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, for, uh, 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 from other logics. So um, wrapping up, because I'm out of time, uh, you know, I've, I've explained how uh, Rust has this sort of extensible um, type system. And in order to make sense of that, we use this, this semantic safety approach. And in order to define the safety contracts that we, uh, um, that we, um, uh, that we use to model uh, the interpretation of interfaces, we're using Iris as this kind of very flexible logical foundation that lets us give a sort of high level interpretation of, the, of these uh, basic concepts in Rust. And, um, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll stop there. Uh, I just want to um, say that you know, all this work that, I, that I've talked about today is really joint work with a lot of other people. Um, and here's some of them. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Um, how complete is Iris? Like, I mean, you, you show the map, right? How can you be sure that, that it will be able to subsume every framework? Oh, I can't prove that. <laughs> uh, I mean, well, we've done a lot of, uh, we've, so let's see, we're go back to that picture. We've done it for a number of, I mean, we've, We've shown how we could adapt a number of, uh, of the most advanced things. So in the original paper, we were particularly focused on like, some of the, the key mechanisms of carousel, ICAP, and TADA, which were, which were well, as you see, they all point to Iris. Um, <laughs> those were some of the most recent ones at the time. Um, uh, I mean, we, oh, there's no way to prove that it's, I mean, well, first of all, there's two things. One is sort of uh, showing that it's, lo that it's actually complete in the sense of you should be able to prove everything that you could possibly want to prove. That We could probably prove something like that because our ghost state is very flexible. Um, but that wouldn't really tell you whether practically you could use it, uh, whether, whether it would be practically useful as a tool for doing that. And there's no way to really prove that any logic is sort of practically useful for anything formally. There's no way to prove that, right? But you, all we can do is sort of do this for many kinds of interesting examples. Uh, or you know, apply it to many ver interesting verification problems. And we've done that in the case of Rust Belt, so something I didn't talk about at all, but uh, is that in, in doing the Rust Belt proof, one of the key things we did uh, that enabled the, 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 the whole verification effort was we defined something called a lifetime logic, um, which was a, a logic with a, a basic notion of uh, an abstract predicate describing temporary ownership of a proposition or temporary ownership of some, of some assertion for a lifetime, okay? Uh, and this was, uh, this was not a notion that we had seen before in any prior concurrent separation logic. Uh, it was clearly useful as a way of giving a direct modeling of Rust's reference types. Uh, and that logic we proved sound in Iris um, using the same kind of uh, approach. Um, and uh, so that was, again, an example where we just, we had, a, we had a sort of application domain and we were able to derive new proof principles as needed. Um, you know, I, can there, could there be other logics that, uh, or other, other kind of proof principles we couldn't prove? I guess, or we couldn't practically prove, it's possible, but I, I don't know. I think we should probably